Welcome once again to the chat room. Nice to have your company. Doing the chatting is the Dean of Sydney, Philip Jensen. Philip, nice to see you again. Great to be here again. And we are here at St Andrew's Cathedral and we're going to chat about a very difficult topic because we're going to talk about censorship and it's really hard to know what to do about censorship. We either want a lot of it if we're getting stuff we don't want or we don't want any of it if we're not being heard. It's a hard one, isn't it, Philip? Yeah, this one is a very difficult one. We've got no solutions, but lots of, lots of issues, lots okay. of ideas. So there's, there's lots of things we need to cover yep. and, and we need to work out what censorship is to begin with. Yeah, that's hard enough, isn't it? As a, as a word, it's a simple, single concept, but yet it covers a whole variety of different activities. Okay, so how does censorship happen? What are the things that can stop information, pictures, whatever, getting through? Well, the easy, simple one is the government. You know, right. The government says, this cannot be published. Uh, this cannot be allowed into the country. By and large, government censorship has collapsed um, because they're unable to stop things. I mean, the internet, it's, it's uncontrollable. Yes, the borders uh, are now open. The borders are wide open, and uh, so that's not really much of a possibility, although there are some countries where uh, there are terrific controls exercised through government. But then there's a whole range of other censorship things. Um, who gets to publish books? Who decides which books are published and which ones aren't? Or publish newspapers with big circulations. Yes, who decides what goes on tonight's uh, news? You see, the, the news on television is different to the news on radio because the news on television has to have visuals. Yes, yes. And so any story that doesn't have a visual, even though it might be highly significant and important to the community, gets censored out. When I worked as a television reporter, I discovered that you needed three things. You needed a conflict of opinions, you needed bad news and good pictures. And yes. if you had those three things, you got a story you got a and you've got to run. That's right. And at the end of the news, you always have a happy story. You know, the dog that's found yes. or the panda yes. bear the or something animal. like that. The yes. furry animal, so we all leave happily at the end of the night. Now, that's an exercise of censorship from the journalistic community. It's just one person deciding, an yeah. editor. And it's not, it's not a conspiracy like an organised conspiracy. But the journalistic community affect each other's opinions. The ones they listen to are each other. And so they have created within the, the, the wider community, this is the story that, these are stories that matter, these are things that don't matter. And that's censorship. The school curriculum is a censorship. These are the books that are worth reading, these are the books that are not worth reading. And so we, we don't get exposed to all kinds of things. And what about language? This is the language you can use, this is the language you oh, can't yes. use. Yes, and politically correct language. So there's a whole strain of words, phrases, expressions, which if you use them now, people chastise you. Yes. And it's, it's, it's not as if it's an official formal sanction, but yes, you choose not to use certain words in certain places or have certain concepts or to say certain things because it's just... That's just not right. You don't say those things. And some people are so sensitive about it that you end up saying to yourself, if not then, that's PPC. That's pathetically political. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but you do, yes. Um, but then there's other ones too. So the government still has censorship on, um, it's a reverse censorship, cigarettes are sold with a warning. Right. Right? So you're not allowed to cigarette, sell cigarettes without the warning. No, I'm not disagreeing. That's a uh, right and appropriate thing to do. But there's that kind of reverse censorship. There's a the censorship of money. So uh, big alcohol firms are able to afford um, to put their advertising on at football time, whereas other companies would want to advertise to that community but can't compete with the alcohol people. And so you can't get your statement on the media because you can't afford to. You buy a voice. The voice costs money. A voice costs money. I mean, in a sense, the wiping out of graffiti. Now, I don't like graffiti. I like a clean environment, etc. But the graffitiist is, you know, it's his last chance of saying something to the community. <laughs> and he doesn't, apart from paying for the paint, he doesn't have to pay <laughs> yes. for his statement. But we wipe them out. The little person doesn't have that voice. Whereas the casino owner... He has a voice because he can pay to put it across millions of homes, etc. Um, th there's a whole range of ways in which censorship works. So it, it's, a, it's a big complicated thing. There are lots yeah. of filters letting information yeah. get through. So is it a social problem or an individual problem? Yeah. It's both and it's, that's our problem. That right. is, as a social problem, we want to address it with government. 
That's when government in our democratic system are elected to deal with social problems. Why doesn't the government do something about it? Exactly. And yet the government now hasn't been able to. It's, it's conceded defeat. Um, uh, there's a film review censorship board. But of course, after you've sat on that for a few years, you're so warped in your view, you don't know what you're censoring anymore. And it's quite clearly out of touch with the community, although it keeps on using community standards as the test. But, but if, it, if it attempts to ban the distribution of something, some film made in France, which we would consider an extremely bad taste and so on, uh, there'll, there'll be a, an artistic community that complains that that's a suppression of artistic freedom. That's right. In the, well, in the 1960s where the great censorship debates took place and, and it was the artistic thing, you know, this mm. movie is of great artistic value. Because the problem is it's not one, it's one drop in a waterfall of movies. <laughs> and you could, can't prove that that one drop wears the rock away. I mean, you could if you were highly uh, sophisticated in your testings, but generally you can't prove one drop wears a rock away. But a million drops dropping on the same spot certainly wears the rock away. And so 30 years later, one of our anti-censorship advocates, uh, Richard Neville, when he saw a movie about a cook and a something other at a feast, he was disgusted. But he campaigned for that he campaigned when he, in the days the of Oz magazine in the 1960s, yeah. yes. But what he saw 30 years later was not what he imagined was going to happen in the 1960s. The dam is broken in that sense. The, the tide has flooded across the country. And so, even if you put it back up and out, there are so many copies of so many movies that you wouldn't want. Yes. It's, it's gone. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not a reversible experiment. It's one of the mm. fundamental problems of what's called utilitarianism, that we judge what we should do by the results. But the trouble is, by the time the results are in, we can't actually go back to where we were if yeah. it failed. It, it's what, what they used to call an impossible calculus. You can't know what the results are going to be till you've tried the experiment. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so it's failed. It's, it's been a dismal failure. Now, what is it that should be censored? I mean, if we're going to think that there should be some censorship applied either by society or by an individual or by us within our families, what is it we want to censor? What, what is it we want to exercise some control over? Garbage, basically. <laughs> there, there is a sense in which you, be able, you should be able to look at something as a person and say, that's garbage. Um, uh, other people might be able to say, oh, you know, for an archaeologist, garbage is very important because it tells you the nature <laughs> of the society. <laughs> yeah. And I say, oh, well, if you're a specialist archaeologist, then uh, you know, please feel free to have my garbage and yes. spend your time raking through it. But my children will get diseased yes. if they yeah. sit there in the garbage. And I've got to teach the children... That's garbage. You don't play with garbage. I've got little grandchildren at the moment, and you know they they are fascinated by the garbage tin in the kitchen. And we've got to keep on closing and saying, don't play with the garbage. Keep society clean. You keep society clean. You keep it healthy. And there's a sense that uh, parents with children have got to teach children well what is garbage. There is intellectual garbage. There that that's important to understand. That is some of the people who who complain about, but this has got artistic merit. The argument is actually a, it, it's a, it's a hoist your own petard argument. Because if it has artistic merit that can improve the quality of life, then it must theoretically be able to degenerate the quality of life. Right, right. You, you can't have it both ways. You can't say literature has an elevating, increasing, improving quality to it, but it can never cause damage. <laughs> <laughs> right. If it can change the viewer or the reader... It can change them for the bad as well as for the good. For the good. Mm. And so you can either say, look, let everything go because it has no effect. And if that's the case, why are you publishing it? Right. Yeah, I mean, what, what's the point? Or you say, no, Shakespeare has a great effect in making us better people in the result. Of, well, if that's the case, then something else can have a terrible effect. And, yeah, I mean, the advertisers know this. Now, now, you've talked about the things we want to censor, but there are dangers in censorship, aren't there? There are oh, things absolutely. we want to make sure don't get censored. Absolutely. So how do you block the bits you want to block and you don't block the bits you don't want? What, what is it we don't want to censor? In a sense, I'm, I'm much more against censorship than I'm for it. Much, much more. Because the dangers are so great. See, why do we want to censor? It's fear is part of the reason. It's lack of control. It's the desire to control and manipulate other people. 
It's the desire to cover sinfulness. I mean, politicians are great for censoring information so no one will know the mistakes they've made. The corporate world is very big on censorship so that no one will know. I mean, the, the asbestosis issues, the uh, smoking issues. Get repressed lot, for years. Repressed for years. Let's keep this information as, as quiet as possible because of the damage we're doing to people. And so uh, we don't want to censor political information. We don't want to censor public health information. We don't want to uh, be censoring the pursuit of truth. We don't want to censor uh, opinions that differ from our own. It's very important that we have opinions differing from our own because it's only as people cast doubt on our opinions that we can weigh up the information. How dangerous could censorship be for Christians? I mean, we've got laws about uh, vilification now and you're not allowed to vil vil vilify the, the homosexual community or homosexual individuals. And I've come across at least one example um, of, of someone from the gay community who thought the Bible should be banned. Mm because of what the Bible says about homosexuality. Mm. Therefore, it should be banned, it shouldn't be allowed in print. So how dangerous is sent or can censorship be okay. to Christians? Can we remember this, how dangerous can censorship be and deal with vilification and come back to that one? Yes, okay. yeah, let's do the, that. The, the vilification one is like blasphemy laws. Um, inside a community, uh, blasphemy laws may apply, but if you live uh, next door to that, you can't really ask the people next door to follow your blasphemy. See, I find it offensive for people to say, oh my God. Yes. I find it offensive to people to say, Jesus Christ. Jesus is my God to whom I've given my life because he has given his life to me. I don't like his name being used like that. Mm. I find it offensive every time it is said. But I don't live in a Christian community so we can't force others to I do that. I can't force others to do that. If right. they want to offend me, well, that just shows how insensitive they are. Uh, that's their privilege to be insensitive. I must try not to be insensitive and say, oh, Mohammed. <laughs> right? yes. I mean, yes. that's, you know, or Allah's. You know, I mean, I don't use those words because if you're in an open and tolerant society, you try and and if you're in a multicultural society, you try and speak in such a way that you can get on with your neighbours and not so, cause unnecessary offence. So it's in, a, in, a, in the community and out of the community thing. So amongst Christians, if someone found themselves slipping into that, we should reprimand them. Oh, so we, no, we shouldn't do that. Yeah. Outside the community, we let it go through to the keeper Absolutely. and keep the relationship intact. That's right, because they, they, they're not, they're some, they're usually not even meaning to offend me. They, they don't even know it is offensive, actually, yes. generally. Yeah. It's a, a, you don't say anything. And so to bring in from a governmental point of view laws against it, that's an overreaction. So Vil are laws on vilification then over an overreaction? Yes. Oh, yeah, they are an overreaction. Yeah. We shouldn't vilify. It's dreadful to vilify people. And government statements, you know, police statements to the media, the public media needs to be wary of vilifying others. I mean, vilifying is a very loaded word. It's very intensive. But the trouble with vilifying is how do you define it? Mm. Well, I mean, I know it when I see it, but it's, it's hard to prove because a highly sensitive person can find anything vilifying. And so if I, to, to continue with the homosexual example, if someone gives a lecture in which they talk about some statistical facts which come out of a particular homosexual community in wherever, Los Angeles or whatever, and, and they turn out to be fairly negative facts, is that vilification or is it not? Yeah, exactly. And I was in Cambridge University. I read a passage in 1 Corinthians 6 in order to speak against adultery. And I was reported by the homosexual, uh, some homosexual community to the Cambridge police, who then reported to um, the, the Times and who I then got uh, rung up and chest about. Because in the paragraph I read, there is reference to homosexuality. I didn't make any comment about it. I didn't say anything about it. I actually picked up the words following it about adultery and spoke about adult, heterosexual adultery. So the sermon actually was, I mean, it was on lots of things, but the only bit of that passage I used was heterosexual adultery. But because the word homosexuality was there and it was in the Bible and I read it, I was reported to the police uh, and, and warned. That's now, the danger, isn't it? That's ridiculous. Mm. That's so, really so, stupid. So we need to be wary as citizens 
of yeah. vilification laws becoming too repressive. Yes. But at the same time, if we're going to live harmoniously with our neighbours... We don't want to vilify. We don't want to vilify. We don't want people doing that too. No. We, there is a certain standard of language that is important. Now, some in the artistic community say, look, it's important that we are able to use strong language for, for its shock level, for its effect level, for communicating to people there is a problem here. Others would say it's important that we are able to make fun of um, religion uh, or of strongly held opinions. Uh, so it diffuses the kind of fundamentalist, extremist, terrorist side if we're able to laugh at ourselves. And so satire, send up. Uh, now, at one level you've got anti-filification laws because you don't want to create social um, angst and troubles and problems. On another side of it, you actually want the right to have satire and fun for the same purpose, to diffuse these kinds of cultural ghettos. It is complex, isn't it? It's very complicated. Okay. Um, now, there was a question we were going to come we, back we to. We were getting back to the question of how dangerous censorship might be for Christians. Yes, it's very dangerous because whatever tool we want to use on others can be used on us. And the way we want to be judged is by truth. And therefore the way we should judge others is by truth. So we want a free market in truth. And you can't have a free market in truth if you won't allow people to say things. That immediately stops the free market of truth. You can't know something is true if, you aren't al if others aren't allowed to speak. Now here, I think, is one of the big problems for the Muslim community. They have such strong control over the flow of information that you can't really, as a Muslim, know whether it's the true or not. Because you're not allowed to question it. You're not allowed to ask. You're not allowed to inquire. You're not allowed to speak against it. You're not allowed to speak, say things. Even now, Muslim viewers of what you and I are talking about are sitting in their chair. You know, this is... <laughs> I, I mentioned Muhammad in a... Uh, an address at uh, the University of Sydney some years ago. Crowded lecture theatre, I don't know, three or four hundred people. I just mentioned him in passing. I can't remember the point I made, but it was a very neutral one. It was a factual one, like the Quran teaches that Jesus didn't die. With that, a Muslim man from the back row stood and came down the staircase and stood across the lecture podium from me for the next 30 minutes for the rest of the lecture. Now, it was a profoundly intimidating moment. I tell you, everybody was listening. Yes. Every, was a, yes. I could have employed him to come <laughs> around with me from place to place because everyone was listening. But, and he had every right to do it. I, I don't mind him, in a sense, doing it. But if you can't even allow the name of Muhammad to be used by a Christian without feeling threatened, then how do you know what is true or not true? So we as Christians mustn't fall into that. No. So if someone wants to come up and say Jesus got married, we, we can say, no, we, we, we're certain he didn't show us your evidence and debate the evidence and that's, it's, it. that's good for the gospel and it's It's good healthy. for us. It's yes. healthy for us. The reason I can... I, mean, it, I read a lot of attacks on Christianity and they generally confirm me in my Christian faith because if that's the best that can be said against Christianity, we're on pretty safe grounds. Yes. You see? And yes. so it's actually... A healthy thing. Now, that's not to say that we don't have or shouldn't have some censorship within Christianity. So, Cardinal Pell, I see, is in trouble now because he's saying that Catholic school principals, etc., should have loyalty to Catholicism. I think good on him, he's absolutely right. Uh, I think that uh, for people who are teaching in a Catholic school, representing the Catholic faith, not to actually believe and promote Catholicism uh, is taking money under false pretenses. I mean, what, why why I do their hands not tremble when they take their pay, pay packets? Yeah, I mean, if I was a Catholic parent sending my children to the Catholic school, I'd expect the Catholic school to be teaching Catholicism. If I didn't like Catholicism, which frankly I don't, I wouldn't send my children to that school, which I didn't. <laughs> but I think But still, right. people I work with, journalists I work with, were horrified at this repressive step that the Cardinal it's had nice. taken. It's not repressive in the slightest. I think that's a perfectly appropriate thing. Now, if I was a Catholic headmaster, or, I would, I would uh, as a human, 
want to listen to the arguments against Catholicism. But I'm not being employed to promote those or to promote that discussion. I'm being employed to promote a Catholic worldview on a whole range of subjects. And it's right and proper for me to. Now, I think it's the same. I may use them, but it's the same in the Anglicans. I think it's appalling to read an Anglican dean saying that Jesus didn't die for your sins. Which, by the way, you'll never hear at St Andrew's Cathedral. So if you want to hear the truth, you can go to St Andrew's <laughs> Cathedral. That was a commercial, by the way. I just slipped that in. Just I slipped just, it in. Thank yes. you. But now, he's every right to believe that. Yes. Absolutely every right to believe that. But not get a pay packet for but believing it. not get it. a pay packet for preaching it. <laughs> yes. Because he's taking the pay packet from people who actually are giving their money to have the opposite preached. Now, set up your own church. It may sound silly. I, I, I yeah. sometimes get the feeling blokes like that joined a soccer club and then they picked up the ball and they're running with the ball. And I think so. Uh, You're in the <laughs> wrong club. You're in the wrong club. Yes, that's right. And, and it's a good club for them to be in the other club. There's no problem about that. And people inside the club should be hearing and listening to what the alternative views are. But when you're on the public platform of the club, it should be reasonable to expect you'll be preaching the public platform of the club. So there, there are dangers in censorship for Christians because if, there, if censorship increased in society, we might be among the victims, we might be the people censored, uh, and we want a free market in truth. We would undoubtedly be censored, and we are already being censored. We're censored in lots of ways. When you look at movies, how often do you see a Bible-believing Christian minister as in any way good, moral, upright, or even sincere? If, if he turns up in a murder mystery, you suspect he's the murderer immediately. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And if he's uh, on the, in the third world, he's a corrupt missionary running away from some <laughs> adultery somewhere else. And, and it's very interesting how often the Christian element is taken out, especially of those kinds of movies that are based on truth, based on real life, they are always de-Christianised. Right. And so all kinds of people, you just, they just remove what they actually believe. Now, it's not always the case. There's a good movie by, on Wilberforce that refers to his Christianity. Very hard to uh, actually make a movie on Wilberforce without referring to his Christianity. Yes. But I'm sure people have thought of doing it. Yes. Um, but there is a censorship, and we will be censored. But it's also, it's just do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, you only have to go into Saudi Arabia to see the censorship of Christianity. Well, we are in power, in a sense, culturally here. We mustn't censor Islam. We should let it speak freely. Just because it won't let Christianity speak freely, that's its weakness. OK, let me draw some th threads together. We don't, want, um, we don't want to encourage massive amounts of censorship. We'll end up being the, the victims of it, as, as we already are in some areas. At the same time, the dam has burst, there's garbage flooding across the land. So we need to know as individual Christians, as parents, what kind of things we can do about this. Is it worth, for example, complaining if we see something on television yeah. that we don't like? We've got to work at the both levels, at the social level, the personal level. Take the social level first. Yes, don't expect and ask the governments to, to solve the problem. It's not soluble by governments, um, only except by extreme repression. It's not going to happen. You can move some kind of uh, uh, increased complaint levels, and I think it is worth complaining from time to time, especially to commercial interests, because they're much more listen, likely to listen to it than the government stations, and say, well, I'm not going to buy those products if you keep doing this. It's worth doing. Programs have been taken off. Commercials yeah. have been taken off. But no, it's always right. important to do it privately right. and quietly, because if you do it publicly... And politely. Yes, and politely, because you do it publicly, all that does is increase the advertising. Yes. And so you run a campaign outside a theatre, that will just increase the advertising for that show that's on. So it doesn't hurt us to do that sort of thing. What do we do with our families? But that's much more important. Self-censorship is where we're actually in in our society now. And we can't just accept the 1950s or whatever model of life where you could say, oh, it's a G movie, it's safe, or it's an M movie, it's, it's not. It's not going to be. You have to watch things with your kids. You actually have to be aware of it. You have to read what the thing is about. Um, you need to read the children's books with the children. You can't just assume or read them before you give them. Talk to the kids. What, what did you think yeah, about that? That's right. A friend of mine saw a movie on an aeroplane, thought it was terrific, 
got off the off the aeroplane, told all his friends about it, didn't realise the aeroplane version had been really seriously chopped. Ah. And so his friends were really rather astonished that this <laughs> minister should be advertising <laughs> this movie, which was full of really unseemly bits. Right. It, you can't avoid the bombardment that's all around you. But we can shelter our kids. But we a can bit. shelter our kids. Yeah. And the key way of sheltering is letting them see what they see and talking through the values with them. So they learn how to process so it. So they learn how to self-censor. Right. Whereas if you say, no, you can never watch any of these things, they haven't learnt what's wrong. So don't just say, um, I'm sorry, the dog took the remote control. Don't do that. No, Sit no. down with them and process it. And I'm not saying show them our movies to show what's wrong. Mm. I mean, I just made a rule of life. I don't watch any R movie. Yep. My family doesn't watch R movies. That's, that's just the rule of life. But even on G movies, we sit down and say, what's the moral behind this? What's that? Now, I don't do it every show. To do it every show turns entertainment into moral. <laughs> you it would let... be t- tiresome. Oh, tedious in the extreme. The kids will hate. No, no. <laughs> but from time to time, you discuss what is lying behind it to give them the skills to be able to self-censor and evaluate. So individually, we self-censor, our, self-censor ourselves, try to say that six times quickly, and we, <laughs> and we, we teach our children to self-censor. Yes. And as far as Socially. the society is concerned, write a letter just yeah. privately, politely, nicely, and, and complain if something happens. Yeah. Look, I've got to say that once again, this has been the fastest 28 minutes on television because we've just begun to scratch the surface of a big topic. And it's a good idea if you and your family talk about this topic. And if, like me, you'd like to hear more from Philip Jensen, you've got to come to St Andrew's Cathedral. Next time you're taking your holidays, if you don't live in Sydney, come to Sydney just so you can come to St Andrew's Cathedral to listen to Philip Jensen. There is a lot to be said about censorship, but we've started the ball rolling, haven't we, Philip? Yes. So, Philip, Massively complicated. We hope that you've enjoyed this edition of The Chat Room, found it stimulating, and we'll see you next time on The Chat Room.